You know, the Bible does a very daring thing when it asks us to believe that everything that happens to us happens to us out of divine love. Even the most dreadful things that happen to people in this life are things that happen to them inside the love of God for them. You see, the God we worship is love. That's one of the most marvelous propositions, that God is love. Now, that's what God is. It's not something he thinks, first of all, although he does think love. It's not something he does, although he does love. God himself is love. It's the very constitution of his nature. It's what God is in himself. And he could no more stop being love than he could stop being God. If God ceased to be love, he would cease to be God. He would, un he would dethrone himself. There isn't a word for it, but I better make it up. He would un-God himself. If he stopped being love, he cannot stop this. Because love is what God is. And therefore you see the grim judgments that we read of in this book of Amos. Which is a book of judgment, are judgments that don't proceed out of God's hatred for his people. See, God hasn't stopped loving them. He does these things because he loves them. And so think of these stark words in chapter 3 and verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You only have I known. Now, that's not casual knowledge. That's not peripheral knowledge. Do you ken Jimmy Smith? You ken Jock McTavish? It's not casual knowledge like that. It's a knowledge that is deep and intimate and personal and persistent. It's the knowledge of a husband and wife. Now, I'm not going to go further than that, but the actual Hebrew word for know here, the word yada. Is, is a very personal and a very intimate word, the knowledge of husband and wife. And that's the kind of knowledge that God had of his people, because God describes himself, you see, as the husband of Israel. Israel was the wife of Jehovah in the Old Testament, just as the Christian church is the bride of Christ in the New Testament. And it's an intimate, personal thing, and this kind of knowledge only operated between God and that miserable nation, the Jews. This is why Paul, you know, in Romans, when he is rehearsing God's love for the Jews in the opening verses of Romans 9, puts God's love at the very highest possible level. Listen to these words. Or you may care to turn them up in Romans 9, because this is a classical passage, the privilege of the Jews. And you remember Paul is, is worried because the Jews are not responding to Christ. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for this privileged people. I could wish that I myself were accursed. 
I would gladly go to hell and be lost forever if only the Jews could be saved. Only one other man in the Bible speaks like this, and it's Moses protesting with God in, 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 in the Old Testament. He says, well, God, if only you spare this miserable crowd of sinners here, I would gladly allow you to score my name out of the book of life. Take my name out and leave their names in. That's love for you. I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race, the Jews. Now, this is what it means to be known by God in this intimate way. <clears throat> Verse 4. They are Israelites, and to them belong... Now, here are the blessings of this special people. The sonship. Israel was God's son. The glory. That's the that's the cloud of light that came down on the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory. This, this shimmering pillar of light that came down and rested on the ark and told the people that God was ready to be worshipped if they were ready. The glory. The sonship. The glory. The covenants. With Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon and so on. The covenants. The giving of the law to Moses and Mount Sinai <clears throat> by the hand of an angel. The worship, that's the, the liturgy, the regulations for approaching God. No other nation had this. The promises, especially that a Savior would come. The promises, to them <clears throat> belong the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and out of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, the Messiah. God, who is over all, and you miss out the word be, blessed forever, because these words are really saying that Jesus Christ is God. Of, of their race, according to the flesh, comes the Christ, the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. Now, I don't know if you're counting, but from verse 4 onwards, there are seven privileges there, plus one. And the last one is the Messiah himself. Seven plus one. One more than perfection. Jesus Christ, more than perfection. No other nation was blessed like this, no other nation was loved by God like this. You only have I known like this. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You see... When love is despised and when love is rejected, it turns to ashes and dust and judgment. It doesn't stop being love. <laughs> you see, if it stopped being love, God would stop being God. He doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't stop hating you when he judges you. He goes on loving you. But the difference is that his love has changed and it expresses itself in a different way. And that different way is judgment. Not necessarily a cataclysmic judgment. Not necessarily something sensational or traumatic or dramatic. But very often a judgment 
that expresses itself in process and graduality in a marriage. Something goes wrong. Family life. Something goes wrong. Money. Something goes wrong. Your health. Something goes wrong. Your job. Your vocation. Something goes wrong. Your guidance about what God wants you to do. Something goes wrong. Your fruitfulness in Christian service. Something goes wrong. And what is happening is that the love of God is trying to reach you in judgment. Can I put this succinctly? You could put this inside a walnut. God is love. It's the first proposition. And secondly, when the love of God is rejected, it doesn't cease to be love. It simply comes out in judgment. Do you believe that? If you do, you are the exceptions because we are now living in a generation which has withdrawn from God the right to judge his people. You see, the churches are full of people, not to mention the world, full of people who somehow think that it is incompatible with God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ that God should judge his people now. That, um, well, this is not really part of the Christian message. It's outside the Christian picture. This is pre-Christian to say that God judges men and women now. I'll ask you that question. Do you believe that God judges men and women now? Do you believe that God brings nations to judgment? And families, do you believe that God's judgments work in families or in churches? Do you believe that God judges churches? Do you believe that God judges individuals now? Do you think God deals with Christians for their unfaithfulness? Now. You see, this is Christian. Listen to these words by Jesus. I think the trouble with many of God's critics is that they've never read God's word. Listen to the words of Jesus if you don't think God judges, doesn't, if you think that God does not judge people now. Listen to the words of Jesus. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Listen to them. There were some people present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. You see, Palestine was an awful country in those days. The Roman soldiers hated being sent to Palestine. It was just a hotbed of insurrection and trouble. The Jews were always rebelling and in revolt. And away up in the north, some misguided Galileans had tried a little private revolution. And Pontius Pilate waded in and put them through the mincer. And he mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices on the altars. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, You see, our trouble is we don't read the Bible. Our trouble is that a lot of our religion is just our own ideas. It's what we think about God and Jesus. 
Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were the worst sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no, they weren't the worst men in Galilee. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell? Eighteen men, they've been crushed by a building collapsing. Chance, you see. It was just chance. It was a bad building. It was unstable. The foundations weren't secure. It just happened by chance. The 18 men were there and the building fell down on them. It was just chance. Jesus said, Do you think that these men were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? Were they the worst men in the capital? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The Lord will judge his people. That's in the Bible. And this also is in the Bible. And you'll be interested to know it's in the same chapter as John 3.16. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. That's very interesting. He that hath not the Son, whatever else he has, hath not life. We can have religion and piety and Sabbath faces and virtue and good works. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Now, I... I would like to think there was a full stop there, but there isn't. You see, the verse goes on, and it says, But the wrath of God abideth on him. You see, to be an unbeliever is a terrible thing. It's to be living under the wrath of God. Billy Graham said, and his preaching's improving, there's not so much superficial evangelistic stuff now from him, although I don't think he should come back to Scotland with a campaign, and I've just told the organizers of such a campaign that very thing. They've been sending letters to ministers. Would they approve of a return visit from Billy Graham? And I've said, no, not really. Not that I'm against Billy Graham or his theology, but I don't think Scotland needs that. I think there's something better going on in Scotland, and I think it's in the Church of Scotland that's going on. Although a lot of people close their eyes to what's going on in the Church of Scotland. Universally, it's labeled dead. It's dead, full of ministers who are heretics and all the rest of it. But there's a lot of life in the Church of Scotland. And there are more people being converted in the Church of Scotland today than anywhere else in Scotland. So I'm not against Billy Graham. I don't care for his methods. I don't think we need American methods to convert Scotsmen. It would be nice if we used Scots methods to convert Scotsmen. But Billy Graham said, I believe that the trouble that has come on us is a judgment of God on us for our sins. And that unless we repent and turn to God, we are finished as a free democratic society. Did you know that 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the following nations had monarchies? Think of all the royal houses that have fallen under the judgment of God this century. 
Russia, czars, corrupt, rotten kings and a rotten church, hand in glove, they deserve to die. Romania, a rotten monarchy. Yugoslavia, Peter of Yugoslavia, rotten with immorality. Women and drink and parties and horses. Germany, Kaiser Willy. Italy, a rotten monarchy. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, rotten to the core. How many aristocratic houses in Britain, I mean lords and ladies and duchesses and all the rest of it, have collapsed under the judgment of God since the turn of this century? How many of them now own houses that are just museums and have to admit the public in order to survive? How many have gone down under the judgment of God? And why is it that Holland survives? Because the last queen was a devout Christian lady, Wilhelmina Juliana. Who's the present one? Will, Juliana. Well, it was Wilhelmina who was the Christian lady. And the royal family didn't like Wilhelmina in Europe because she wouldn't go to all the high society affairs. She didn't like their drink and their parties, and she wouldn't go, and she was despised. She's a lovely Christian lady, although she got mixed up with one or two cranky people at the end, faith healers and that sort of thing. But she was a marvelous Christian soul and had a great testimony for Christ. And when she died, she was buried in a white coffin. And they sang sanky hymns at her funeral. An event in a lifetime to see the Duke of Edinburgh singing, There is sunshine in my soul. That's what they sang at her funeral. Since Jesus showed his smiling face, There is sunshine in my soul. There is sunshine in my soul today. And all the royal heads in Europe, what was left of them, had to stand round that white coffin and sing sanky hymns. Hallelujah for old Wilhelmina. But that's why their monarchy is surviving. And I believe that the survival of the British monarchy depends on the godliness or otherwise of the present members of it. Or do you believe that monarchies go down by chance? Surely you know the story of Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister in 1939, and of his catastrophic fall from power. A weak man, surely shallying with Hitler in Munich, the bit of paper, you remember, coming out of the aeroplane, peace in our time, he said, waving the bit of paper in the wind, peace in our time, and Hitler's factories churning out the submarines and the tanks, Neville Davidson. You know his tragedy? He was an evangelical Christian. But he didn't tell anybody... <laughs> And you would never know from his life that he was an evangelical Christian. He had factories in Birmingham that were making brass idols to sell to the heathen in Africa. And in a few months, it was finished. And Winston Churchill was in with a coalition government. Do you believe that God judges men and churches and families and households and nations? The Lord will judge his people. But look at these verses. Look at these words. Amos chapter 3 verse 12. Is there any hope? Yes, there is. 
verse 12 says that there's a remnant who discover a place to run to from judgment. He describes them here as two legs of a sheep being pulled out of the lion's mouth or a bit of an ear being taken away from the lion's mouth, a corner of a couch, bits of furniture, a bit of a bed, a remnant. And from this time onwards in the Bible, there is a golden thread that has to do with men and women who have discovered a place to run to where they can be safe from the judgments of God. Isaiah's full of it, but we can find it in Micah, who was a, a bit nearer Amos. If you turn very quickly to Micah, you'll see that from the opening verses of Micah, Micah is really preaching to this northern kingdom of Samaria, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. The two capitals, the northern and the southern kingdom, Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you, hearken, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming forth out of his place, and he will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will be cleft like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this coming judgment is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel, both kingdoms. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria, the capital city? And what is the sin of the house of Judah in the south? Is it not Jerusalem, the capital city? Two capitals, you see, the, the, the nation was split. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her images shall be beaten to pieces. All her hires shall be burned with fire, and all her idols I will lay waste. For from the hire of a harlot she gathered them, and to the hire of a harlot they shall return. For this I will lament and wail, I will go stripped and naked, I will make lamentation like the jackals, and mourning like the ostriches. For Samaria's wound is incurable, and it has come down to Judah. The south is poisoned as well. It has reached to the gate of my people, right down to Jerusalem. Is there any hope from all of this? Well, there is. You see, Micah sees what Amos saw and Isaiah saw. That there is a place you can run to. Micah chapter 2. I wish there were time to study all this teaching on the remnant. Because it, it goes down to... To Joseph and Mary, you see, the remnant, just a handful. Joseph and Mary and Elizabeth and Zechariah, the parents of John the Baptist, and Anna and Simeon waiting for the consolation of Israel. And then there's Jesus. And then there's the church, you see, right down through the ages, the Middle Ages. Not the great big church, which was all dead and, and rotten and, and corrupt and heretical. Not that church, but the church inside the church. Ecclesiola in Ecclesia, the little church inside the bigger church, the invisible church inside the visible church, the remnant. It's a, it's a great theme, this. Micah 2 and 12. I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel, an invisible church. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach, this is Christ, you see. 
He who opens the breach will go up before them. They will break through and pass the gate, going out by it, and their king will pass on before them. It's Christ, the head of the church. Their king will pass on before them, the Lord at their head. Chapter 2, I beg your pardon, chapter chapter 4. And verse 6, oh, these are great words. Somebody set them to music, please. God says, I'm going to gather all the poor things, all the nervous, timid wrecks, all the hopeless creatures, and I'll make them the remnant. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, the poor things, and gather those who've been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant. I hardly need to tell you where they've run, surely. Paul could tell you in First Thessalonians, he says, Jesus, who delivers us now, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You see, that's what makes you a member of the remnant church. Have you or have you not fled to Jesus? Have you or have you not found in Jesus Christ a refuge from the wrath of God? Micah 4 and 7 and the lame I will make the remnant oh hallelujah for these words they should be in gold leaf or something and those who were cast off people who were under judgment I will make a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and for evermore chapter 5 the coming of Christ of course verse 2 you O Bethlehem Ephrata you who are little among the clans of Judah from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel this is Christ Bethlehem whose origin is from of old from ancient days therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in travail, Mary, has brought forth. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the end of the earth. Oh, it's everywhere. There it is in verse 7, you see, of chapter 5, the remnant of Jacob. There it is in verse 8, the remnant of Jacob, and so on. I'll tell you what Amos is saying here that if you want to escape the judgment of God, then you must bring your sin to Jesus because he is the sin-bearing lamb of God and our judgment fell upon him. Sometimes we say as we come to the Lord's table that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Now that's one of these horrid theological words and it means very simply this. Propitiation is the turning away of God's wrath. And that's what has happened in the death of Jesus Christ. God has begun to smile on you. God has begun to be propitiated 
suspicious towards you. God now looks upon you with pleasure. Jesus Christ is the turning away of God's wrath for our sins. That's what Amos is saying. If you want to escape the wrath and escape the judgment, nowhere else is safe other than Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless the preaching of the word.